Welcome to ETSU Department of Psychiatry's Grand Rounds. Dr. Aiken is our presenter today. Dr. Aiken got her Bachelor's of Arts at University of Tennessee in Knoxville in speech pathology. She also went to University of Texas at Dallas for her Master's in Audiology and got her PhD from Vanderbilt University in Nashville in Hearing Science. Dr. Aiken is currently the clinical audiologist for the director of the Vestibular Balance Laboratory at James H. Quillen VA Medical Center here in Mountain Home. She's also an assistant professor at the Department of Communicative Disorders here at ETSU. Previously, she worked at Central Michigan University slash Vanderbilt University um, Audiology Distance Learning Program. She's been a adjunct professor, Department of Hearing and Speech Sciences School of Medicine at Vanderbilt. Also, audiology, speech pathology at ETSU here as well. Um, and that today she'll be talking to us about vestibular and impact on TBIs. Dr. Aiken. Thanks. Okay. Can you guys, can you hear me? Am I on? No. Nope. Maybe not. You can't hear me. Good. Well, thank you, first of all, to Dr. Moore for inviting me here. Um, First, I would like to get kind of just a feel for the background. Um, is, I'm assuming everybody is a, a clinician in the field of psychiatry. Anybody in primary care? Is that a wrong assumption? No. Nope. Okay, good. So um, I'm talking kind of out of field, I'm sure, and um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, and we haven't really begun to look at our data yet in terms of um, some psychological overlay in people that have balance problems related to TBI. But I want to finish up that way and maybe even um, open the discussion and get some input from you all. Um, so before I start, um, I'm required to say that my views do not represent the Department of Veterans Affairs or the U.S. government. And my disclosure is um, at least this one grant. We've actually, our lab has been funded through the Department of Veterans Affairs for about maybe 15 years now. Um, so our work, um, the focus of, of today's talk is on the impact of traumatic brain injury and blast exposure on the vestibular system. And so it's been known for some time um, that there's a connection between war-related injuries and dizziness. And in fact, Dr. Uh, Barony received the Nobel Prize for his, in medicine for his work on the vestibular system. He's the only person that has received a Nobel Prize in this area. And some of his work was um, actually addressed this idea that um, uh, the soldiers that he observed in World War II one in Austria um, that had head injuries reported uh, vertigo. And um, so that was some of the original work or early work in this area. Um, and since then, there have been other studies. Uh, this was one that from the Korean conflict that suggested that um, over half of the veterans that had head injury had complaints of um, giddiness or vertigo. And so in terms of the scope of the, of the problem, it kind of depends on how we're measuring dizziness and what the symptom is um, and who the population is. So anywhere from 15 to 78 percent of patients with a head injury will report dizziness as a post-concussion um, uh, symptom. And one of the troubling aspects is that these symptoms often last for six months or longer. So they don't go away like a lot of vestibular disorders do that are, that are more self-limiting or short-term. Um, and we've learned more and more, particularly recently, on the impact of dizziness on um, uh, social and working life. And um, there was a study done in, in Europe that looked at the social impact of dizziness and found that about half of patients that had dizziness reported a decrease in their efficiency at work, and a quarter of them um, reported that they, they gave up some of their work or had to change their work as, as a result of dizziness. Um, so in our, our focus for the past six years has been on the impact of TBI and blast exposure on the vestibular system, 
And some of our, our two key questions are what causes dizziness and imbalance in patients with mild traumatic brain injury, and how do we manage uh, traumatic brain injury related dizziness and imbalance? And it's not, a, it's not a simple question. It may seem simple. It may seem like, ah, it's the inner ear. It turns out that it, there are numerous causes of dizziness that are not confined to one medical specialty. Um, so here are some examples of some causes of dizziness. And, um, and it's, not, uh, it's not all of the possible causes. It's a few of them. And these um, are symptoms or can be related to traumatic brain injury as well. So there's a lot of overlap in vestibular dysfunction um, and, and causes of dizziness um, uh, related to traumatic brain injury. Um, in addition, uh, there's really no commonly shared vocabulary for describing dizziness. So if you ask a patient, you know, um, you're here to uh, let us assess your dizziness, could you describe those symptoms to us? One person may say lightheaded, one person may say drunk, one person may say woozy, and you know, there's no commonly shared um, uh, vocabulary, which makes it challenging uh, if you're trying to diagnose the cause of dizziness or study the cause of dizziness. Um, in addition, the balance system is complex, so it's a multimodal process um, that includes input from vision, vestibular sy system, um, proprioception or somatosensory, this is, it's integrated in the brainstem and cerebellum and results in, in uh, motor outputs um, in terms of uh, eye movement to keep gaze steady when our head is moving or through the vestibular spinal reflex uh, to uh, ensure postural stability. And so damage can happen anywhere through these, in these pathways that can result in, in some balance problems. And the final uh, factor that makes figuring out the cause of dizziness in a certain population difficult is that balance is dynamic. So it's always being, balance disorders are always, um, patients are adapting and compensating for that. So you may have, um, see a patient um, that has certain test results, vestibular test results, and the same patient as they adapt may come back with the same test results, but we may not have reflected that vestibular compensation or adaptation in our test results. So our, our, the testing doesn't always impact um, where they are in this, in this uh, recovery process. And some assumptions in the literature regarding dizziness and TBI when we first became interested in this question was um, that dizziness and imbalance following head injury or traumatic brain injury is related to the brain injury. And uh, so that was an assumption. And certainly there are data that show, especially with some of the uh, uh, diffusion tensor imaging, showing diffuse axonal injury. So we know certainly that in some individuals that is the case. Um, but we also know that dizziness and imbalance can also be related to actual a peripheral vestibular system damage. Um, and so that can be another assumption. And in the, in the VA, we are very interested, most of the traumatic brain injury is related to blast exposure. And, um, and the impact of blast on the ear, on the inner ear particularly, is well known. And it's been studied, and um, obviously it impacts any fluid and air-filled structures, which include um, the inner ear. The common um, result of a blast is a tympanic membrane rupture, and, but it can also damage sensory cells in the inner ear. And that can, and that can cause noise-induced hearing loss or tinnitus. And this research is well known. What's not known and what's not really been done very much is the impact of blast on the vestibular system. And this is important because the vestibular sensory organs have sensory or similar sensory epithelia as the auditory system. Um, and, there, and there are two types of vestibular organs. There are the semicircular canals 
that sense um, head rotation or angular acceleration, so three semicircular canals, two pairs that are paired on either side of the head. And there are the otolith organs um, that are housed in the vestibule. And the otolith organs uh, sense linear acceleration or tilt or gravity. And all of our vestibular testing until very recently has focused on this horizontal semicircular canal. So everything that we knew about the impact of traumatic brain injury um, and dizziness and the impact on the vestibular system was based upon this one organ, so one of these five vestibular sensory organs. And a, a unique feature of these otolith organs is that they um, contain otoconia, which are calcium carbonate crystals, and overlaid on these organs and overlaid on the sensory cells in the, in the otolith organs and allow for these organs to be gravity sensitive. Um, and perhaps, I, um, oh, I'm jumping ahead. And so these two vestibular um, types of vestibular organs contribute uh, via these two pathways to eye movement, to keep gaze steady when our head is in motion via the vestibulo-ocular reflex pathway, and through, uh, and to, um, uh, muscles in the limbs to keep, in the spinal cord to keep uh, the vestibulos, uh, via the vestibular spinal reflex to keep upright posture. And so I'm always asked, I, I mentioned that when I first prepared this, we had a, the, the secretary of the VA um, asked for a state-of-the-art conference um, a year ago, I think it's been a year ago now, um, on TBI. And a lot of people were excited because it's the first time a disease got that much attention by a cabinet member. So the, the secretary was there. We presented our work. And anytime we talk about TBI, one of the things that we always, a message that we try to share is one of the most common vestibular disorders. And we don't study it per se in our group, but it's important to know that, that benign paroxysmal positioning vertigo is one of the most common vestibular disorders associated with head injury. Um, and it occurs idiopathically as well. Um, it's one of the main reasons um, patients have vestibular disorders. Um, research that has focused on BPPV in patients with dizziness following head trauma have reported that it occurs in about 10 to 25 percent of these patients. And the mechanism for BPPV is well known. Um, it's canalithiasis, which is free-floating otoconia, those carbonate calcium crystals that move out of the otolith organs and into usually the posterior semicircular canal. So the symptom that the patient experiences is this brief vertigo that's provoked by head movement. So the classic triggers are I get dizzy when I look up, when I turn over in bed, um, and it's very brief, and they describe a clear spinning sensation. And so what happens is that the, the, these otoconia are in this canal, of the posterior canal. The patient's head is upright. When they tilt their head up or lay down in bed, those crystals move through the canal, causing indolent flow, which activates the sensory cells in the posterior canal and causes brief vertigo once those crystals settle, the symptoms, the vertigo goes away, then the patient sits back up, and they're going to move the other direction, causing vertigo again. And we do this, we see this clinically often. We actually have a BPPV clinic at the VA, um, and we treat these patients. They're treated very effectively with canalith repositioning therapy, um, which is just moving those crystals, putting the patient's head in a series of positions. Uh, to move those crystals through the posterior canal and get them back into the vestibule where they should, or in the common cruise where they should be. And numerous studies have looked at the effectiveness, which is 80 to 100 percent, depending upon the study. There are guidelines, um, uh, the American Academy of Neurology and um, uh, otolaryngology, head and neck surgery have both um, developed guidelines in this area. And an advantage is there's no special equipment needed. So 
we always try to kind of put the word out. This is a really easy thing to treat. It's very debilitating if you have it, but this is one vestibular problem that we can get rid of very effectively. Some of the clinical barriers uh, to BPPV, though, is a lot of times patients have a delay in diagnosis, and some, and it's really just they, they report it to a primary care physician or another physician, and it's missed, and they're not ever referred to care. And so numerous studies, this is one, that showed a very long delay before a person finally gets uh, uh, treated uh, and diagnosed for BPPV. So this is a study in England that um, suggested uh, 93 weeks from their, uh, the beginning of their symptoms until they were, uh, or from their first referral to treatment. We looked at our data at the VA. So we have a BPPV clinic, so we're looking for BPPV. And um, about a third of our patients had been living with BPPV for over three years, um, which really is not, is not necessary. Um, other studies that have looked at kind of clinical pathways um, have found that um, only 11% of providers evaluate patients for BPPV with appropriate diagnostic tests, which, by the way, are available on YouTube. Um, so I know my cousin is an emergency room physician, and he, uh, he often has said, yeah, I go to YouTube, and that's how I fix these patients. So it's worth doing, and it's, it's an easy thing that any provider that sees a patient can, can fix um, fairly effectively. Um, and one important study showed that um, oftentimes if these patients go to, to the emergency department, they may um, they often referred for unnecessary tests uh, like imaging or a CT scan that, that um, amounts to, on average, um, over $1,300 per patient. So again, the treatment is just literally putting a patient in the position with their head hanging off the bed um, to watch their eye movement and confirm the, the nystagmus and the vertigo that occurs. So it's very uh, easy treatment and effective, uh, effective care. So, in addition to BPPV, a blast or, um, can impact um, the sensory cells um, as well. And so there um, is not new data, but um, uh, these are some data from um, a study from in Ireland where they looked at uh, um, 10 blast victims in a restaurant bombing. Um, in the 1970s. And they found that in these individuals that some of the, the, the most damage were in these otolith organs, that there was rupture of these two organs, um, these otolith organs. And, and this is important because, again, I told you that we were only, until recently, only able to assess this one organ. So, you know, we could deal with BPPV, but if we just had damage to these organs that was not BPPV, we really didn't have a way to test these two, these two inner ear organs, the otolith organs. Um, there's other evidence that TBI and blast could damage the otolith organs, and that is, again, the high incidence of BPPV. So we know that that's also related, that the otoconia, BPPV is caused by the otoconia coming loose and moving into the posterior canal. Um, so that suggests there's some damage or some process, some mechanism that's impacting um, uh, are causing the, the BPPV and impacting otolith organs. And then finally, one of the most common symptoms with a patient with TBI-related um, uh, dizziness is imbalance. And uh, the otolith organs really contribute to postural stability. So that vestibular spinal reflex, um, some of the major contributions, mainly because they're able to sense um, gravity, so whether or not our head is upright or tilted, that information is sent via um, the vestibular spinal reflex to help uh, keep balance um, or postural stability. So we had this evidence that, or some kind of indirect evidence, that uh, part of the problem with these people that had dizziness or complained of dizziness following TBI might be due to this otolith. Um, uh, the otolith organ dysfunction, but really until recently, we, ne again, never had a way to test. And it just coincidentally, the work in our lab until we got 
um, involved in uh, TBI had been focused on otolith organ assessment. So we were using a new uh, test called vestibular evoked myogenic potentials where we were recording from the sternocleidomastoid muscle and able to get um, some information about whether or not uh, the otolith organ pathway uh, function. But I'm not going to bore you with the details about that work. But what I want to do is kind of give you an overview of um, the state of the art on TBI and vestibular dysfunction in, in, um, in, in other studies as well. So um, this, this table shows um, a series of studies that examined um, vestibular function uh, in people that had been exposed to TBI in the dark blue and in the light blue more recently looking at blast exposure. And as you can see, the majority of the studies looked at horizontal semicircular canal function. So that's been, again, the test that's been around for many years. That's a caloric test. Maybe you're familiar with the video nystagmography or a caloric test where you put water or air in the ear to stimulate the horizontal semicircular canal and measure the nystagmus. Um, that's caused from that, from stimulating the, the vestibular system. And so the majority, all the studies looked at that, um, at that test and um, found, and, and this is probably a high number because the way they interpreted their data, but it, um, so the, the number of subjects that, or patients rather, that had abnormal findings ranged from about zero to 50%. And so recently, people have begun looking at otolith organ function, and that's actually been shown, particularly in a couple studies, to be a, um, the cause um, of a lot of the dizziness related to the, or imbalance related in these, to uh, TBI in these patients. A few studies have looked at ocular motor function um, as a measure of impact on the central nervous system uh, and uh, again, the results have varied across studies. Um, a better measure is probably imaging, a, a more direct measure at the impact um, um, uh, of really brain injury on, on dizziness or balance. And then finally, people have looked at gait imbalance um, disorders and using different tests um, and found that, that uh, the frequency or the incidence of gait and balance um, can range from about 4 to 37 percent. Let's see. So what have we been doing? Um, we've been looking at um, veterans for about a five, four or five year period um, that had uh, blast exposure, traumatic brain injury, um, or both, often both, um, and then an age match control. And so again, this was a, a study funded by the VA. Um, and when we developed the study, there were some knowledge ga gaps and so that we were concerned about. And first of all, we didn't know the impact of blast exposure on the vestibular system. So we were learning the impact of TBI, traumatic <laughs> brain injury, bless you. Um, but we really didn't know the impact of blast exposure. And again, because of the impact of blast on the auditory system, it made sense to us that it, that, that it could also, that maybe what was happening in some of these individuals was that we really just had a peripheral vestibular um, damage. And so again, that was that question. So again, was the damage peripheral? Is it the central pathway um, or, or both of these individuals? And we were concerned because when we looked at the literature, most of the literature used subjective measures of vestibular function. And so, in other words, questionnaires or symptoms or scales. And very few studies used objective measures of vestibular function. Um, and we were concerned about this because we knew that symptoms of dizziness and imbalance were mediated by PTSD or depression. And um, so, in fact, uh, many of our veterans that have a history of TBI um, or a history of TBI is, is associated with exposure 
to this traumatic event, and that then increases the risk of PTSD. And a, an interesting or aside is when we first um, submitted this grant to the VA, we were asked, asked to exclude all of the subjects that had PTSD. Well, I'll jump to the end of the story to tell you that it ended up, well, we obviously said that's not possible, and it ended up that 92% of this group did have PTSD. Um, they have also, through Hogue um, and other studies, have shown that the symptoms associated with TB TBI, um, including dizziness and imbalance and some of the other post-concussive symptoms, um, were mediated by PTSD or depression. So there was this comorbidity. And so again, subjective measures of dizziness we knew were more influenced by the effects of PTSD um, and uh, anxiety. Um, than the objective measure. So we really wanted to look objectively at vestibular function and so and wondered if some of the studies that had these very high incidences of vestibular dysfunction were really related to just symptoms and not necessarily peripheral organ damage. And then again, they were often limited to one of the vestibular um, sensory organs the horizontal canal. And so these were our aims um, to, to look at the effect of TBI and blast exposure on the peripheral vestibular system, um, specifically both types of organs, so as comprehensive as we could be at the time, um, and to look at um, uh, the impact of central uh, vestibular CNS functions through ocular motor testing and also through some imaging testing, which I'll mention here in a minute. And we looked at postural stability and a dizziness-related quality of life measurement. And then again, we had these three groups. We had veterans with dizziness and balance following TBI and blast exposure. So oftentimes the blast occur or the TBI was related to the blast exposure. We had veterans with dizziness and imbalance following TBI only. Our goal was to have equal sample size in both groups, but that was not possible. The, the majority of the individuals had uh, both TBI and BLAST, um, and then we had a few individuals that had BLAST only and an age-matched um, healthy controls. So we performed vestibular function tests, and I'm going to not go over all of these, but to tell you that we did the basic caloric test and then more complicated and newer rotation using a rotary chair um, to more uh, uh, precisely control the stimulus to the horizontal canals. And then we measured tests, we met, uh, measured otolith organ function using vestibular evoked myogenic potentials that we've been studying for years in our lab and also using a subjective visual vertical measurement, having a patient align a bar vertically while we stimulate, while we used a linear acceleration on the rotary chair, so we moved the chair off axis to stimulate uh, uh, or to, to present a linear acceleration and stimulate the otolith organs and then had them align the bar vertically. We did a series of balance and gait tests, um, one of them that I'll mention here in a minute, and the most um, probably well-known test is posturography, um, computerized dynamic posturography. Um, that's actually uh, been used clinically for years. It's actually a billable um, uh, balance test. Um, and then some gait tests as well. And then used a, the dizziness handicap inventory um, as a quality of life measure. And so we performed some ocular motor function tests, which really just screen for CNS function. Um, but we collaborated with some colleagues at Wayne State University on neuroimaging, Mark Hackey, who developed susceptibility weighted imaging, and then another colleague, Tony Case, who had um, experience in um, uh, um, spectroscopy. So uh, we used DTI um, to look at white matter lesions, and we use susceptibility weighted imaging to look at some of the microbleeds um, and vascularization. And then um, we're still in the process of, of um, analyzing some of our spectroscopy data.
And so recently we um, have a paper that's coming out in brain injury, and I thought I would at least just show my colleagues that normally present the data are not here, but I thought I would show this one figure of the uh, susceptibility weighted imaging in these four individuals that we presented in this article that had dizziness and balance problems following blast um, and traumatic brain injuries. And so you can kind of see these, are you able to see that at all these yellow air arrows show these two microbleeds. Um, here there's one microbleed there and one here in these four individuals. Um, and then there's this darkening um, in the septal vein for this uh, um, third subject. So um, all four of these individuals showed these microbleeds and they had other abnormalities um, on some of the other imaging tests too um, that I don't have available here. And so to kind of just summarize, because I don't want to take you through all of our data um, and get to kind of the, the, the take-home message, where at least where we are at this point with vestibular test findings, um, we found uh, that there were significant differences between our control group and all three of our experimental groups um, for otolith function and balance and gait. So uh, there was a higher incidence um, of, and I don't have our control group, unfortunately, in here, but there was a higher incidence in otolith dysfunction. This is just the at number of abnormal frequencies. So the higher the bar, the more ab subjects had abnormal findings. Um, but there was a significant difference between our control group for OLIF testing and balance and gait testing. And across groups and tests, the frequency of the test abnormalities ranged from 22 to 71 percent. So we saw, I think, probably even in some of the tests, more abnormalities than we even expected. And the most frequently, the most frequent abnormalities, which is really important, I think, for future directions, occurred in balance and gait. And, and interestingly, a lot of those individuals, or a, a, a good group, a section of those individuals, did not have vestibular dysfunction. So they had balance and gait abnormalities, even with no um, uh, peripheral vestibular dysfunction. And about half of them, um, of the TBI and BLAST groups, had abnormal vestibular function. And the frequency of otolith organ function, which was one of our, which was our hypothesis, one of our hypotheses, was occurred greater or more often than semicircular canal abnormalities. Um, so this has important findings for how we manage these people, and it may also explain why some of these individuals don't get better. Again, when you have the, the common or the, the kind of classic vestibular dysfunction, if you have a vestibular labyrinthitis or vestibular neuritis, it often impacts the horizontal canal. And that's been the test that we're familiar with, and we know people recover pretty quickly. And all of our treatment for patients with vestibular dysfunction, like physical therapy treatment, is based upon what we know about the horizontal canals and how they recover. So this has opened up a whole new area of research in terms of how to manage these patients with, with dizziness related to otolith or balance problems related to otolith dysfunction. And we're actually involved in a study um, uh, at the um, VA and DOD uh, consortium. It's the chronic um, effects of neurotrauma um, consortium uh, in Richmond. So we're looking at the impact of otolith dysfunction on um, uh, gait and balance and quality of life. So what I wanted to share with your group that I've not shared with anybody else yet to get your input is to look at this frequency of PTSD and look at a pattern that we're seeing with some of these patients and some of the balance testing. And so this table just shows these groups and the incidence of PTSD. And so we, we measured PTSD by a diagnosis in the medical record, but we also obtained, um, we, we uh, used the detailed assessment of post-traumatic stress, the DAPs on these individuals. And we haven't begun to analyze this data um, because we don't have 
anybody in psychiatry or psychology that is collaborating with us on a local level. So we are open to any collaboration, and I'll just kind of put a, that self-serving <laughs> statement out there that we have the data um, uh, available and ready to be analyzed if anybody's interested. So I told you that there was this high frequency of balance disorders in these individuals. And so this is this one test. This is a figure that shows the four groups, the controls. The controls um, and, and these data points represent the uh, equilibrium score for, a, uh, for posturography, which I'll show you here in a second, um, for these four groups. So this uh, horizontal line, dashed line, is a normal value. And anything above it is normal. Anything below it is abnormal. So you can see that these experimental groups often had this abnormal posturography measure. But what was, and, oh, let me back up. What is posturography? This is posturography. Somebody's standing on a platform. They've got their uh, harness to help just for safety purposes. And they're taken through a series of conditions, starting with standing with eyes open. It's basically a Romberg. And then standing with eyes closed. Um, then uh, the surround is sway reference. So if the person moves, the surround moves. Um, then they do that with, then the, the floor also sways. And then both the visual surround and the floor sway. So we start with easy conditions. And it gets more difficult when we could get to this condition five or six. Um, and look at this pattern that we saw with, a, with a, a, a pretty good number of these individuals. This is actually one of the individuals that we um, wrote up in that, four, that case study paper in, in brain injury. So here's the printout that you get on these in the normative day, or the, the results, rather, um, in, in this one subject. And this, this uh, light gray area are, reflect the norms. And so here's condition one, the very easy conditions where you're standing, um, eyes open, nothing's moving. Um, so so these, this individual was, way, was quite a bit significantly below normal for his age. Um, and then look what happens. As the conditions get harder, conditions four, five, and six, look how well this person performs. And so that's, not, that's, a, that's what we call an aphysiologic pattern. And we don't, we're not saying that the person was malingering. Um, it could be effort. Um, it could be related to um, uh, some brain injury that is impacting these results. Um, but it's, it's been really interesting and um, difficult to uh, really um, explain. And so we really need a better understanding of this impact of psychological overlay on some of these test results, but also on these symptoms. Because um, the other thing that we'll see is sometimes these patients will go through therapy and the results might, some of the results, their functional results might change, but their symptoms continue. And so we're not sure why they continue. And there's actually a whole growing body, a pretty large body of, of literature on chronic um, dizziness that has been kind of associated with like a conversion disorder. Um, mainly Jeffrey Staub at um, Mayo Clinic has focused on that. Um, but uh, another concern is of ours is how is that impacting the response to rehabilitation? Um, so anyway, that's what I wanted to share with you all. Um, if you have suggestions, um, feedback, that's what I would be interested in. Um, and our future directions are just related to longitudinal, uh, let me mention that. So one of the, our, another future direction is to look at the longitudinal impacts of traumatic brain injury and blast on vestibular function. And we've already begun that, and it's six individuals. So we brought six of these subjects back. And what was really interesting to us was that there were, was one individual that had normal vestibular function on the baseline when we tested him five years ago. Um, but his balance and gait tests were abnormal, and he went through um, some mental health 
health therapy and that after we tested him came back and everything's within normal limits. So it's clear that we need to be collaborating um, with our psychology, um, psychiatry uh, colleagues and not, uh, not, do, not work with this uh, group alone. Um, again, we're, I think I already mentioned, we're curious about functional consequences and already um, working on that in another study. Um, and we're also looking at some different rehabilitation techniques for people with otolith uh, dysfunction and have a, have a study going on where we're using this centrifugal force, this off-axis rotation to stimulate the otolith organs to see if we can see a change in function in those individuals. Um, so that's it. And I would, again, welcome any feedback um, on related to your area or suggestions that you would have for us um, with that. Thank you, Faith. That was wonderful. I've got so many questions, I'm going to just limit myself to one, okay. and then maybe later on we can talk a little more. But my question is, do you take non-VA entitled patients for your studies? Yes, we do. Well, it depends on the study. Um, some of the, the study that we're working with, it's the DOD-funded study and VA study with, in Richmond, we cannot. This study we did, but it's, it's close to accrual. We do have some others that we take non-veterans in, though. I have an interesting patient, and I would like to tell you a little bit about him. He came to me with a diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia, and I never, ever detected true symptoms of that diagnosis. And his main complaint was dizziness. And he uh, had been to see many ENT um, physicians, and once they saw that he had a diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia, they just backed off. They weren't really interested. And I don't think he's really ever had a really good assessment. Mm -hmm. And the reason he got labeled with paranoid schizophrenia was that he would feel very self-conscious in public when he would be feeling dizzy. He would say things like, well, people are looking at me and so on, which sounded paranoid. But um, then when I convinced him in the end that I didn't really believe he had paranoid schizophrenia, and I wanted to change the diagnosis. He didn't want to change it because if I changed it, he'd lose his social security. And he said he was so handicapped by his uh, dizziness mm. that he couldn't work. Mm -hmm. So it'd be great if you could have a look at him for me and tell yeah, me what you that'd think. that'd be great. I'm not surprised by that. I've heard, we've had, there's one case that I always share with students. Um, it was actually a patient with BPPV that I saw and which has very objective findings. That's one of the easiest diagnoses to make in terms of vestibular dysfunction. She was treated, and she was supposed to come back for um, uh, follow-up, and she, in the meantime, reported some anxiety and depression and was put, I think, on E2 on the psych ward at the VA, and they canceled all of her vestibular appointments. And I think the idea was that she doesn't have BPPV, so, but it worked out. You know, I called her provider and explained BPPV and were able to follow her. Because it was, it, it was not the only reason for, you know, it wasn't the reason for her depression, but it certainly was part of the reason, and we had objective data. It wasn't just because um, it wasn't an anxiety-related symptom. Um, but those sometimes, I think, do get confused. Um, we get concerned about that happening quite a bit. Did you have a question? Well, just, just sort of a comment. Um, you talked about the um, strong relationship between persistence of PTSD and um, these symptoms. And, and here you've got a slide that talks about psychological overlay. And I'm just wondering whether the relationship between anxiety um, and inner ear function is more integral, more inherent than simply an overlay. But by analogy, sure. um, if you want to reproduce the experience of panic in someone, just interfere with their breathing. Mm -hmm. uh, and it happens almost automatically. Yep. And it would be a mistake, I think, to say, well, that's an overlay mm -hmm. on respiratory sure. function. Right, right. Maybe here, here, I'm wondering if there is kind of a, a very deeply hardwired mm 
um, uh, anxiety response related to fundamental safety for anything that mm -hmm. could make you fall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if you think about it outside the realm of science, you go back to the 1950s when Alfred Hitchcock made his famous movie, Vertigo. Um, the experience of vertigo is used in horror movies to yeah. evoke anxiety in people. I think there's something very yeah. fundamental about it. It's not just an overlay. And it m would make sense to me to consider that people don't get better from PTSD or don't respond to PTSD treatment as well when they have this additional problem because the additional problem is driving an ongoing hyperarousal mm -hmm. that you can't treat psychologically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. One of the things I share with my students too because the idea that the anxiety followed the vestibular disorders, which is I think what you're saying. I mean, I've said, I always give them the example, you know, what if you were a younger woman with Meniere's disease where you have these episodes of severe vertigo um, that are, oftentimes can be incapacitating. And, you know, you're driving your child to school and that happens while you're driving your child to school. That's, that's going to cause anxiety. And so, yeah, I agree. That's a good point. Um, I'm not, and I'm not saying which one comes first. I, I really don't know, and it probably it's not the same in everybody. I'm gonna, <laughs> but uh, I'm just saying that that's not our area of expertise, and we know that we need to focus on that because it is impacting, I think, a big portion of this population. Um, yes, so we need your help. Uh, mild postural sway has been associated with early signs of CNS HIV infection. Mm. And uh, I wondered, uh, related to that, that uh, specifically deficiency in the pontocerebellar tracts, since HIV is found more frequently in patients with PTSD, and PTSD is in turn associated with uh, traumatic brain injury and, and blast uh, uh, induced injury specifically. Uh, have you seen a, a higher rate of patients with HIV than you would expect in your sample? To my knowledge, we haven't seen anybody with, with HIV. I'm like Dr. Moore, I've got so many questions, I'm not sure where to start. I'm going to hand the microphone back to him in a second. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, first I'm going to make a comment about this aphysiologic pattern. Like Dr. Schacht, I am somewhat concerned that it may not really be aphysiologic. Mm -hmm. It may be that, in fact, the more impaired have become systematically habituated, much like you would desensitize somebody with panic, such that their anxiety is now relatively mastered compared to those with very mild sy symptoms who don't have to master mm -hmm. the process. So their anxiety remains very intact and very much driving much of the pattern that you see, whereas yeah. the ones with the more severe uh, conditions, exposed to more severe conditions, have already habituated mm -hmm. and are not over-anxious. My, well, relatively speaking. Um, my other question is, in regards to DTI, I thought you did a very nice job summarizing the nature and the neuroanatomy of vestibular to oculomotor to mm -hmm. protect all, all of the spinocerebellar anatomy, but I, I'm sure that you and I would both agree that you got a very small portion of how yeah. complex that system truly oh. is. And my impression is that DTI is not yet to the place where it can resolve enough of the anatomy to really be able to read the coherence of such a complex system especially one buried so deep in the brain. I wonder if you could address DTI and its, its I, resolution currently. I, I think one of, the, one of the factors that we faced was we don't really have a vestibular cortex either. So where do you even look? Um, and we spent, and that's kind of just emerging as well. Um, so yeah, I, and that data has just begun to be analyzed so I couldn't even give you any results. Um, but it's probably been used more than any other technique in the TBI literature, not necessarily with vestibular dysfunction or dizziness, rather, but some of the o other post-concussion symptoms. Um, You're right about the cortex piece, but 
I had not heard until I heard from you this ocular motor tracking idea because, of course, mm -hmm. that does have a cortical representation. Sure. Yeah. And it strikes me that if we could actually map at that level, it would be fascinating to find out. Mm -hmm. The one other thing I was going to say is I think that even more than conversion disorder, the model that often is talked about with tinnitus and dizziness, chronic dizziness of this nature is its similarity to phantom limb pain in the fact that these reafferentation pathways, particularly at the level of the thalamus, are, if you will, confused or incoherent. But at this point in time, I'm not aware that we know of any specific ways to enhance mm -hmm. the coherence of those mm -hmm. pathways. Mm -hmm. Though Dr. Moore has told me some very interesting things about uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation and tinnitus. Yeah, talked about that a little bit. So, you know, finding a way to restore mm -hmm. those pathways to healthy function is, is mm -hmm. critical. And then the last thing that I'm going to say, Dr. Udi from South Carolina was up at our Psychiatry in the Mountains conference uh, and gave some very interesting commentary about panic disorder and anxiety in general. One of the things that he was talking about was that the amygdala are very much out of routine response levels in people with PTSD. They um, attend to things that others don't and they fail to attend to things that others often do mm -hmm. focus on, um, and that that dysfunction is there. I've never heard anything said about the laterality of these problems, mm -hmm. but even in PTSD, we think that cerebral lateralization issues may be involved in some of the phenomenology. Yeah, and I don't know, you know, that we can get at some of that with the, with the testing that we did, especially with the imaging, but... Again, wherever you focus, you know, at least it, not with the susceptibility weighted imaging, but with the DTI, you know, wherever we're focused, or in spectroscopy, um, especially with spectroscopy we, where we're putting, using the voxel-based um, techniques, you know, you only are going to analyze that section. Um, so we, we really haven't, like I said, our early, I wish that we had, um, some colleagues that we could have collaborated with at the beginning of the study. And I agree with you, we're always really hesitant to use that term aphysiologic. And when we, meet, when we use that term in this context, we're really talking about that it doesn't match any physiologic pattern related to vestibular disorders or other balance disorders that we're familiar with. Um, so I, that's a great point, and we actually, yeah, but for want of a better term <laughs> at this point. Related to Dr. Hendricks' comments about the potential methodological limitations of DTI, yeah, seems yeah, like yeah. MRS might have an advantage. And particularly, I wondered, you mentioned some data available for MRS. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there any data that you know of that shows that NAA is uh, different as a marker of neuronal cell dysfunction and cell death? Thank you for your attention. Appreciate it.